This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Good evening. Welcome to the Glazov Gang. Tonight, Brandon Strzok, the hashtag walkaway campaign founder who's on a mission to red pill humanity. Brandon Strzok, what an honor and a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Wow, so this walk away campaign, really growing big. I see you on Twitter as well. There's a very interesting exchange with David Hogg that I want to get into. But let's start at the beginning, Brandon. You were at one time a leftist, a liberal, whatever you want to call it. And I'm sorry even to say this here, but I think you voted for Hillary. Let's begin, let's begin there. Well, all of that's true. Yeah, um, I, I was um, a Democrat voter my whole life, uh, lifelong liberal. Uh, I, I often refer to myself as a kind of a Democrat by default um, because I'm gay and that's what gay people are supposed to do, right? We're supposed to be Democrats. Um, I did vote for Hillary in 2016. I was absolutely devastated when Trump was elected. And um, yeah, it's all true. <laughs> okay, Brandon, so just, you know, I've watched your videos. I've, I've uh, you know, s watched you on, on several shows. Really fascinating stuff, but let's just get into this a bit. I mean, you, you were really devastated by Hillary and, and uh, by Hillary's defeat. And you even said that you also even literally cried that Trump had won, correct? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I did. I, as a matter of fact, um, the day after the election, I got on Facebook and uh, all of this still exists, by the way. Um, I got on Facebook and I made a video and the video is about an hour and like 20 minutes long where I'm just like just purging my emotions and I, I cry like three or four or five times during that video. And then um, probably mm, sometime within a week, I, just a few days after that, I did another video and I started crying again. And, and that's just when I cried on video. Then I was also crying a lot, you know, just in my bed you know, over my breakfast, at lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so tell us the mindset of the leftist of what you were thinking, because for the left, for Trump's victory, I mean, this is just nightmarish. Tell us a few of your thoughts of why it was so devastating in the leftist mindset that Trump had won. Well, because for a lot of us on the on the left, we had been spending the last, at that time, the previous 18 months, uh, believing everything that the mainstream media had been telling us about who Trump was and who his supporters were, what his campaign was all about, and what his intentions were for the country. And namely, what that means is that we believed that America had elected a Nazi and you know the second coming of Hitler and we believed that um, all of his well see okay we believed that all of his followers were bigots racists and whatnot but I think what was a lot of the reason why I was so devastated and I was you know crying and upset was you know of course the shock that it had happened and that Hillary hadn't won but also that there there was this sort of like underlying fear because the media had been convincing us for so long that he had no chance of winning. I mean, uh, I think we all saw the polls that week that, you know, some of them, uh, I think it was Huffington Post, and some of them it said he had like a 3% chance. So when he won, and won pretty, uh, you know, hardly, um, there was also this, this feeling that, you know, of betrayal and suspicion like, who voted for him? You know, like you were just kind of like walking down the street, looking at people going, did you vote for him? Did you vote for him? You know, it's like, so it suddenly it sort of felt like we were living in this world of filled with covert bigots, you know, people who were, who people who were being nice to our face and smiling, but behind closed doors secretly hated gay people or hated black people or, you know. Right. And, and you were also on the net telling people off and recriminating and reprimanding people who voted for Trump or potentially did, right? Yeah. Okay. So Brandon, it's fascinating the story of a person who had second thoughts 
and came out of an ideological movement or a cult or, or whatever. And David Horowitz has written just one of the most fascinating memoirs. It's called Radical Son. And he talks about his journey out of the left and those significant turning points. And in David's life, the Black Panthers killed a friend of his. And he was a, a leftist. And then he shows how he gradually began to climb out of the left because he noticed that none of the left cared about this murdered friend of his. Now, in your case, I just want to go step by step here because this is fascinating. Even before Trump's victory, you had already begun to have some second thoughts, correct? Yes. Can you tell us about some of those second thoughts that you began having? Yeah, I mean, it was... That's the the second thoughts I was having before the election really sort of were when I was starting to see these holes in the logic of liberalism and and not just in the logic of it, but really the ways in which people were treating each other, uh, which which mostly stemmed from identity politics and PC culture, political correctness. Um, let me think of a few examples. Um, I have, you know, th there was... I remember one time uh, a few years ago, this was kind of a big one for me. Well, I was, you know, I was starting to hear people talk more and more about privilege, privilege and victimhood and white privilege. And, um, okay. So in, uh, in 2015, the Supreme court, um, decided that marriage equality was the law of the land. And as a gay person, uh, this was something that I supported. Uh, I, I've always been an advocate for, for gay rights and gay marriage. And in my mind, we, we, the gay community, had sort of climbed this mountain, we'd crossed the finish line, and I felt like we should be, you know, kind of celebrating this victory that, you know, we did it, we, we, we won this hard-earned battle, we, we won the culture war, we, whatever. And the, the victory, there was no victory. It was like we crossed the finish line, and then the next thing I knew, you know, the acronym, the, a, the LGBT acronym just began to grow and grow more and more and and suddenly we were talking about non-binary people and gender fluid people and, and i had never even heard these terms before i didn't know what people were talking about and then suddenly we weren't gay people anymore we were queer people and uh and basically if you ask somebody what it, what that mean what does it mean to be a queer person no one can give you an answer that makes any sense essentially it's just about anybody except for a heterosexual person and that this is a way of ensuring that we can continue this narrative that people are, are victims. And when people really wanted to, people in my community were pushing for this, you know, like, oh, we're, we're queer now. I started vocally objecting. I said, you know, I don't, I don't want to be called queer. Uh, I, I think it's, it, it lacks dignity. I think it lacks class. I think it, uh, it's demeaning and degrading. And um, when I started vocally saying things like this, whether it be in, conversations with people in real life or on social media, I started getting attacked and told that uh, I was just using my gay male privilege. And I was, you know, being a, a privileged white gay male. And so I thought to myself, this is, this is insane. I'm now being attacked within my own community by non-binary people or, you know, a, black lesbians or you know and, and then i started to see you know more and more we were talking about white privilege and and um and there's another example shortly after this where i was um i was i was sitting in a park one day eating my lunch and um uh, on, on a break from work and um a man came up to me who was he just happened to be hispanic and he i was on the phone and he stuck his hand in my face and he said uh i need some money and i hated the way that he approached me. And so I kind of was on the phone and I just said something like, go away, go away, something like that. And uh, he punched me. And uh, when he punched me, he said, uh, you're a white privileged piece of, mm. now I want to make clear, I'm aware this person was probably mentally ill. Okay. Like I'm not even, I, I'm not so much upset with this man for having done that. But after it happened, I got on social media and I started saying, oh my God, this crazy thing happened. This Hispanic guy came up to me and hit me and told me I was a white privileged piece of whatever. And all of these people on social media immediately started jumping in and being like, well, I'm a white person. Nothing like that's ever happened to me before. You must be, you must be leaving out part of the story. You must have provoked him. What are you not telling us? And I was like, 
wow, it's like people have become incapable of conceiving the idea that, you know, a person of color could possibly do something wrong or that a white person could possibly be the victim of a, a violent act or something without having provoked it. You know what I mean? It's like people were yes. sociopathic. And um, so, I mean, just lots of things like this are beginning to happen more and more and more. And, and it just, I, I started to see this being a real problem. Right. Thank you, Brandon. And so just two quick th thoughts of mine before we move forward. You know, some of those 60s radicals, they were always saying, they said, we're going to give those university administrators, we're going to give them 20, set, 20 points of demands. And then when they meet those demands, we're going to have another set of demands. Because this is an agenda. And anything, as you discussed, any, any victory that's won, then it proceeds. Because there's an agenda here. And also in terms of what you're saying, how frightening that idea, these utopian ideological revolutions, in the end they begin to devour their own and to eat their own. And we saw this in Stalinist Russia, Maoist China, the Khmer Rouge killing fields. And we're seeing it in, in the leftist movement here in the United States right. and, and in the West. So Brandon, let's move forward a little bit now. So okay. after the Trump um, victory, and you were upset and crying for a while, etc., and then all of a sudden a friend of yours began to show you how you had been misled and how many people had been misled by the establishment media and the Democratic Party. Yes. So um, I, you know, I was taking to social media a lot to sort of rant and purge my feelings about the election and to also um, cast a lot of, you know, judgment and scorn against the people who had voted for him. Now, I voted, uh, I, uh, I grew up in Nebraska, in a small town in Nebraska, and so I knew that I had a lot of family and, um, and friends, people I grew up with who all voted for Trump. So... I felt this huge sense of betrayal and, and I, you know, so I was leaving these long rants, you know, like, how could you do this? How, you know, and, um, I'm a pretty strong writer and, um, I, I have, when I want to, I can have a pretty, uh, you know, vicious, uh, you know, uh, a pretty vicious voice in my, in my writing. And so I, um, I was writing a, a, a piece one day about, um, you know, how could you vote for this man who could, stand there before a cheering crowd and mock a reporter's disability, you know, and, and, and the people behind him are cheering and, and laughing and, you know, like, what's, what's the matter with you people? And this woman who um, I've known, she was actually a babysitter of mine when I was literally a baby, and she's a conservative and she's very religious. And uh, I was actually talking about her earlier today and I was saying, you know, in retrospect, I, I don't even know why I continued to be friends with her on social media for so many years because we would we just battled back and forth for so many years about so many issues but still for some reason I I never unfriended her and and I'm I'm glad now that I didn't but she she approached me after reading this and she wrote, she wrote me a private message and she's you know she just kind of said look I please don't like bite my head off but have you seen this and she submitted to me a YouTube video and I'm kind of paraphrasing, but the title of the video was something along the lines of uh, debunking that Trump mocked the disabled reporter. Now, I read this title of the video and I became enraged because I just reading the title, I was like, you know, this is obviously propaganda, uh, right wing pro propaganda. Uh, this is obviously something that has uh, designed to sort of gaslight people on the left or, or uh, to you know, to to fool the excuse me, to fool the people on the right into uh, believing uh, you know some this false narrative. Anyway, so I watched the video fully prepared that I was once it was finished, I was going to reach out to her and say, "How stupid can you be? Can't you see that you've been brainwashed?" And what happened next was I watched uh, several minutes of footage of Donald Trump. Um, mostly on the campaign trail, but also footage of him from years previous before he was even running for president. And it was him doing that exact same voice and that exact same gesture as he used when he was uh, uh, imitating the reporter. But in, in multiple circumstances with multiple different people, 
but the commonality was that in each situation he was making fun of somebody when they had been caught in a lie or they had been doing something shady or they were groveling because they were being dishonest and they'd been caught and it was very clear that this was sort of a thing that he does when you know he's making fun of somebody who's lying it had nothing to do with the reporter's disability uh yes the reporter was disabled but it wasn't about that it was about the fact that this man who happened to be disabled was caught in a lie mm -hmm. and um it, it's very difficult for me to explain the, the what happened to me in that moment because it i've never ever had this sensation in my life before and i've never had it since but there was a complete disconnect between my brain and my heart because my heart was telling me, I, but, but we hate him, but we hate him, but, but we hate him. And my brain was saying, but I don't think he mocked that guy's disability. Oh my God. And um, I didn't want to believe it. Uh, and I actually had to watch it three times and I couldn't, like, I couldn't process it. I couldn't believe it. So I had to shut the computer and I kind of told myself, okay, I'll watch it again tomorrow and see how I feel tomorrow. So the next day I woke up and I watched it again and I, I was like, okay, he, he didn't do that. Like he, he really didn't make fun of that guy's disability. And then I was like, but why would the media say that he did? Like, I, I don't understand. And so then I started kind of, well, the first thing I think I did was I reached out to friends and you know other liberals and I was like, what do you make of this? And a lot of them just by reading the title of the video weren't even willing to watch it. And they they were becoming hostile with me and being like, "What are you doing? Like, what do you what? Are, like, are you are you defending Trump? Like, you do you love Trump now? You know?" And I was like, "Look, I don't I don't love Trump. I'm just you know I'm just trying to get the to the bottom of you know the truth here. Like, what's going on?" And um and I, I it was really apparent to me very quickly that this was not a conversation that people were open to have. Like, people wanted to believe that the sky was falling, and they didn't want to be told differently. Yeah. And. and and you were committing a thought crime. I was committing a thought crime. <laughs> and it's interesting, just off the top of my head, how this pathology works is that in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, there's many stories in my family where people who were supporting Stalin, but then the people who were criticizing Stalin, they'd say, be quiet, you're going to get us all killed. So there's a dual thought system there somewhere. I know many leftists that you know they pretend that they disagree with me or they'll be arguing with me but then behind the scenes they let it be known that they're terrified of the people on their side they will literally be extinguished by the people on their side for their thought crimes so so and a lot of people are terrified of of leaving the left and uh, and i want to get to that with you because the left is unforgiving and we, you know, it's a social community. It's, it's, and we have our friends and we have our self-identity and self-image, etc. We'll get to that. So, so, Brandon, so through this, you figured out and you saw that CNN, MSNBC, Anderson Cooper, Rachel Maddow, Don Lemon, somewhere you had been lied to on so many of these issues and you began a new path. And on this new path, you began to see they hate more clearly the left's demonization and dehumanization of white people, of straight people, of 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 all kind, of masculinity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So tell us about what you began to see once you had taken the red pill. Well, so, okay. So what you just described kind of goes back to the liberalism ideology, identity politics, and stuff. So to be clear, that I was already starting to see that. Um, but it's, it, cause it's almost like two different things. You know, the, the liberalism was slowly becoming more and more, um, both intolerable and illogical to me. But then it was like, once that became combined with the knowledge that the, the liberal media had been so dishonest about, um, you know, their portrayal of Donald Trump and his supporters and what his mission was and what his campaign was. And they did that by, you know, it was like they acknowledged that liberals are triggered by social injustice. Like that's something that most people know. I mean, I live in New York City. If, if, if we tried a social experiment in New York City where we just screamed on the street, you're a racist. I promise you, everybody in the vicinity would stop dead in their tracks to see what was going on and see where the racist was and how they could get involved. You know what I mean? Uh, that's how liberals are. And so that's what the media did. 
And I started to see how, you know, uh, it's true. I mean, it's like uh, they're, they're, they're starting to become this ratcheting up of, of hostility towards white people and towards straight men. And, and, and the media was feeding into this too. And so were the, the left-wing politicians. It was all just sort of a machine that was working together. And um, yeah, and then the more that I saw these things, that I, I was trying at first I was, you know, because I was scared. I, I was, you know, it, it was as, as simple as saying, you know, like, what would, how can I, how can I bring this up to other people in a way that they won't react in maybe a way I would have reacted before I figured it out. And I couldn't really find a successful way to do that at first because it was like every time I tried to talk to people about what I was learning and, dis and discovering through, you know, doing research about the media, about the politicians, about, you know, um, or just liberal issues, you know, like the, the wage gap, the you know, all these different things that the the left tries to tell you is going on. Um, people were becoming inc like just increasingly hostile and treating me with more and more contempt, and people were cutting me off on social media. Uh, and some people not only were you know uh, stopping being my friend and cutting me off on social media, but actually slandering me uh, on social, you know, saying. See, I've been sober for three and a half years, which is my sobriety is something that I have an enormous amount of pride in. And people know this about me. Um, it's something that I take very seriously. But, you know, then a lot of people were going on social media saying that I was doing drugs again, that I was drinking, that I was having a nervous breakdown, that I was losing my mind simply because I was, you know, asking questions and or, or, or just you know, trying to get to the bottom of the truth and, and kind of pushing back against liberalism. Thank you, Brandon. And look, it's a scary thing to do because from all of my study of this lifelong study, look, this is a cult and, and people are terrified because the leftists are standing there saying, Nazi, white supremacist, Nazi, white supremacist. And a lot of people just, these leftists, they just want that to be said about Trump and supporters of Trump. And they don't want to be accused of that. But then there's some people brave enough that they do leave. And they say, you know what, I don't care what I'm going to be called. But you lose your social life. You lose your self-image, your identity. It takes a lot to leave the left. And you've gone through that now. And you've started the walk away movement where you've walked away. And you're encouraging now other people to walk away from this cult slash plantation of the Democratic Party. So tell us about Walk Away. Well, so after, as I was saying, you know, I, I was trying to have these conversations with people and I was met with an enormous amount of hostility and contempt and vitriol and and I lost a lot of my friends. And uh, so I went through an incredibly lonely year in 2017. I mean, by the time the year ended, I didn't really have that many people left in my life. And um, by the time this year started, 2018, I made my very first conservative gay friend. It took a long time, but I found somebody in New York, and through him, I started to meet a few other people. Once I started to make a small network of, you know, just a few other conservative gay friends that I had in New York, uh, I, I, I started to get a little bit more, um, uh, you know, uh, self-confidence about uh, speaking out about all of this. And I made a decision... Uh, somewhere around February or March, I would say, well, sometime early in the year, that I was going to just sit down and write what I call the definitive manifesto about everything that's wrong with liberalism and everything that's wrong with the Democratic Party. And so I sat down and I kind of wrote this script and it just sort of flowed out. And um, initially it was going to just sort of be something that I posted online, just in written form. I was just going to write it and put it out there for people to read. Well, after I wrote it, I read it. And, and I thought, I mean, I just thought this is, I think this is really good. <laughs> like, I, I think this deserves better than to just be stuck online somewhere for people to read. And I thought I'm going to shoot a video. And um, so I kind of had this idea in my mind for something. I wanted it to look really kind of slick and impactful and be a little bit dramatic, but also very, very narrative and, um, and informative. And I made the video and I, I really liked what I ended up with, but there was still this little part of me that said, you know, your life is going to change. If you put this video out there, there's a good chance that nobody will ever see it. You know, maybe 50 people will ever watch it and the 50 people who watch it will hate your guts. Um, and so I, I got a little bit, um, you know, I was nervous about that. And I thought, well, maybe if I didn't put so much pressure on this to make it just about me, Maybe if I encourage, you know, I'll make a video, but then maybe if I encourage other people to make a video too, because I know that there are a lot of other people who are feeling the way I'm feeling. I can't be the only one. 
And so it was sort of this way in which I thought, well, I'll put myself out there first. I'll, I'll throw myself under the bus. But I know that if I really, really encourage people, maybe this will, this will encourage other people to follow suit. And so I decided to create what I call the hashtag walk away campaign. And this is a testimonial campaign, which it, it, it exists on all platforms of social media at this point, but it, the genesis of it was on Facebook. Um, I released my video to Facebook and I told other people, look, go to this hashtag walk away campaign page on Facebook. Please create your own video. It doesn't have to be something extravagant, amazing. Sit in your car and point your camera at your face and just tell your story about why you're walking away from the left. Or if you're on the right, you can make a video too because you know for so long, the left has controlled the narrative about what it means to be a conservative. You know, the, the left has hijacked the definition of conservatism to mean that you're a bigot, you're a racist, you're a Nazi. I want people on, in the silent majority on the right to get their voices back and to sit in front of their video cameras and say, tell the truth about what it means to be a conservative. And people did it. And Brandon, your video, extremely profound and powerful. We're gonna tell our audience where they can go watch it if they haven't yet and all those testimonials from former leftists, but also conservatives, very powerful. Before we tell our audience where to find all of these things, I gotta ask you a question. I'm a little bit uncomfortable asking this, but you know they were saying that Trump is controlled by Putin, but David Hogg has sent out a tweet that this hashtag walk away movement is actually Russian propaganda. I have to put you on the spot here. Have you been meeting with Putin Dmitry, Ivan, and Igor in dark alleys and being told what to do here? Um, no, I, I mean, I, I would love that. It would be very exciting if I could tell you that that's what was going on. But it's, no, it's just little old me and my video camera. That's, that was the extent of uh, any, uh, any involvement from anywhere on that campaign. No, of course, but Brandon, of course I'm joking, but this is the mind of the left. David Hogg, you know, he survived the, you know, the, the high school shooting there. He's become a gun control leftist activist. He's been attacking you. And I mean, I don't think I've read such a moronic tweet in a long time. He says, hashtag walk away is Russian propaganda. Is this all they have? Well, I think it's understandable that David Hogg might feel that way because I don't think David Hogg has ever been involved in a campaign that wasn't uh, influenced by propaganda. And he hasn't ever been a part of a campaign that has sprouted up organically uh, as mine has. Uh, my pro my uh, campaign isn't being sponsored by CNN uh, and it's not being sponsored by the Democratic Party. So David Hogg has never had experience being a part of a campaign that sprouted up organically simply by the needs of and the wants of the people. Thank you. So, da um, so Brandon, one thing before we wrap up, as I've always thought about this, the leftists I know, I'm very willing to be a friend with somebody that's a leftist. But for leftists, if you don't agree with them politically, they can't be your friend. And, right. and I mean for most of them. And Che Guevara has said things about this. Lenin has said things about this. And in your case, for sure, I mean, it's, it's almost a given that you had to lose all your friends. But to actually think about this, the friends that you had could not accept you as a friend anymore because you thought differently politically. What do we make of that? And what does it say about the left? Well, here's the thing. I'm actually, believe it or not, able to have a, 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 an enormous amount of compassion for all of them, even the ones who slandered me on the way out the door. The reason why is because they legitimately believe what the media is telling them. And the media is telling them that we have a bigot, a Nazi in the White House, and that he's staffing his administration full of, you know, KKK, bigots, racist, haters. I mean, imagine if that were true. Just imagine for a moment if we did have the second coming of Hitler in the office. I mean, these people really would be kind of heroic to a certain degree because they're not going to stand for it. Unfortunately, that's not the truth. That's not the reality of the situation. They have been brainwashed. Um, you've used the word cult several times. It's That's a word I try to avoid using just because I am, I feel like in a position where I'm trying to open people's hearts and people's minds. And I, I think it makes it harder to do that when using that word, but, but you're not wrong. It is a cult. I mean, it is. And, um, you know, so they believe these things. And so in their minds, you know, they're thinking, well, how could I be friends with anybody? 
who could support a fascist, you know, Nazi dictator. And that's why they have to disconnect. I mean, that's what their religion tells them, that they have to disconnect because they are morally superior and anybody on the right who's a conservative is morally deficient. Yeah, and that's, yeah, absolutely. And that's how they want to see themselves. It's all about left, it's all about how they want to see themselves. I'm sorry to interrupt, we got to go. Brandon, what does Brandon Strzok think about Donald Trump today and about Donald Trump supporters or most of them? Well, I love Donald Trump supporters because they have, well, because they're great people and they've shown me an enormous amount of love since I began the Walk Away campaign. And all I can say is that 2020 cannot get here fast enough for me. I cannot wait to pull the lever for Trump in 2020. Wow. I bet you couldn't have believed several years ago that you would be saying that. For all of our, for the Glazov gang audience that's on the edge of their seats right now, excited, they want to support you. They want to get involved in the hashtag walk away movement. Maybe we have some leftists that are going to walk away. Maybe we have some conservatives that just want to give their testimony. Where can they find you? Well, if they want to find me on social media, um, they should go to um, the unsilent minority um, or they can use my handle, um, which is at US minority. That's on everything. Twitter. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, at U.S. Minority. The Walkaway Campaign, uh, at this point, we have walkawaycampaign.com, which is being built. It's an ongoing process. But the majority of the testimonials you'll find on Facebook, on the hashtag Walkaway Campaign group page on Facebook. Facebook, the, the unsilent minority. Yeah. And on Twitter, the unsilent minority. And it's also at U.S. Minority. Before we go, Brandon, final words of wisdom from you. Ooh, that's putting me on the spot. Um, well, I mean, I just want to encourage anybody out there who's you know, still on the left to take a good look at what's going on. And, uh, you know, just do your research. Don't believe everything just because you hear it from MSNBC, CNN, Rachel Maddow, these people you trust. Listen, if you want to continue watching those sources, great. But you know what? Dig a little bit. Do your own homework. Look, look for the numbers. Look for the statistics. See if what you're being told actually matches the factual materials that you can look up and research yourself. Brandon, uh, you're an extraordinary person. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your truth-telling today. And thank you for trying your best to, to help people uh, think for themselves and not to have the fear of leaving the leftist plantation. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Brandon, for joining us. We hope you'll be back. I will. And thank you. And to our audience, the unsilent minority, Facebook and Twitter, at US Minority, and just look up Brandon Strzok, and also hashtag walk away. Join the battle. And please don't forget, we're a fan-generated show. If you like what we do, please go to jamieglazoff.com to support the show, and please subscribe to the YouTube channel of the Glazoff Gang. Good night.